This video will review my technique for extended blepharoplasty, orbital malar ligament release, and fat transposition. Preoperatively, the infraorbital hollows in the tear trough area are marked in the upright position. A standard subciliary incision is made and extended past the lateral canthus. Lower eyelid is suspended with a 60 nylon suture. In order to preserve abicularis function, a skin flap is elevated in an extended fashion, inferiorly with using sharp scissors. This dissection is continued down for approximately one and a half centimeters from the lash line, as demonstrated here with the ruler. A submuscular flap is then elevated at this most inferior point of the dissection by piercing the abicularis. You can see the orbital fat and orbital septum poke through, and then this flap plane is then dissected medially and laterally in order to expose the area just above the orbital rim. The orbital malar retaining ligaments are then released. By continuing the submuscular dissection inferiorly, I use a bipolar forceps to lift the abicularis muscle to cut through the orbital malar retaining ligaments. You can see that the suf is left down, that is the yellow fat that's poking forward, and this also creates a potential space for our later fat transposition. Next, I reduce the lateral orbital fat pad. I do this because I found that transposing the lateral orbital fat will often retract and result in fullness in the lateral orbital region. I usually reduce this fat with a bipolar forceps down to the level of the orbital rim. The medial and central fat pads are then transposed. Before this can be accomplished, the inferior oblique muscle must be first identified, uh, which allows us to have better confirmation of the medial and the central fat compartments. What we see here is the orbital fat being released from the orbital septum. I prefer to do this because it allows for greater inferior transposition of the fat and volume. You see this with the medial and the central fat compartments here. I use a fibrochromic suture to take a bite of the periosteum and soup, which is left down, and then pass the suture back and forth through the medial and the central fat compartments. I prefer this over a subperiosteal repositioning, which requires transcutaneous sutures, which are removed in the short term, where the fat can retract back into the orbit. This is the central fat pad now being transposed. Another nice part of this approach with the open technique is that we can now sculpt the fat, placing sutures between the medial and central fat compartments to create a more confluent fat volumization along the entire infraorbital rim. And then we can also sculpt it medially and laterally with some more sutures. As we see, the central fat compartment being redraped further laterally. Acanthoplasty and skin muscle flap suspension is now performed. First, by dissecting in the area of the lateral orbital rim superiorly. As you can see, this is the section is on the inner aspect of the orbital rim. Sutures are placed up high, just above the area of the lateral canthus. Two sutures are placed, one so that we can perform a canthoplasty and the other for the flap suspension. I always perform a snap test at this point prior to placement of the suture. And we can see that after placement of the suture through the lateral aspect of the torsus, through the orbicularis muscle and tightening it, the snap is actually improved significantly. I always stretch the lid margin superiorly to make sure that it has not been over tightened. The second periosteal suture is placed through the skin muscle flap and then tightened in order to support the lower lid margin further, as you can see here. We now see a good filling of the orbital hollows as well as redraping of the orbicularis muscle. Vectoring and conservative skin excision is now performed. What we see is, is that the flap is redraped in a more superior lateral fashion, and more skin is excised in the most lateral aspects, approximately 6 or 7 millimeters here, only 1 or 2 millimeters medially. We cut down to the area of the excess, place a single hook, and sharply excise the lateral skin, which is the majority of the skin to be removed. And as we continue the excision medially, there's approximately 3 millimeters then at the pupillary margin, there is essentially no skin removed. After closure, we see good redraping of the orbicularis and removal of excess skin and filling of the infraorbital hollows. Some representative results from this technique. First, a woman in her early 60s with large amounts of orbital fat to transpose with good volumization of the infraorbital hollows and upper cheek. Another patient in her mid-50s with good blending of the lower lid eyelid cheek junction. Another patient in her early 60s good volumization of the lid cheek junction. Another patient with very deep orbital hollows, adequately filled by orbital fat transposition without autologous fat grafting. And lastly, another patient in her mid-50s, again, good redraping of the orbital fat.